In this lesson, we're going to cover John chapters 2 and 3, and I'm going to call these chapters Old and New. The old water of purification of the Jews is going to be turned into sparkling new wine. The dirty old temple is going to be cleansed in the second half of chapter 2. And Nicodemus in chapter 3 is going to find out that he must be born again, born anew. And so the old is giving way to the new with the coming of the Messiah. So let's start in now with John chapter 2. We find Jesus and his disciples have been invited to a wedding at Cana of Galilee, a small town not far from Nazareth where Jesus grew up. And when they get there, Jesus' mother is uh, part of the uh, serving group, I guess, because she becomes aware and alerts Jesus to the fact that they have run out of wine. We need to say a word about wine to start with because uh, people get upset thinking that Jesus made a bunch of wine and made a bunch of people drunk. So let's understand what wine was like in the first century. First of all, natural wine, that is grape juice that has fermented, becomes at maximum 12%. Uh, alcoholic. The Jews and the Romans and the Greeks all diluted this wine before they drank it. They did that for two or three reasons. One was to make it go farther, but the water made the wine safe to drink so that it did not produce such intoxication, and the wine made the water safe to drink. You'll remember that Timothy was told by Paul to Take a little wine for his stomach and not just drink water. Even today, water in many places of the world, the Mediterranean uh, countries included, water can make a person sick with Montezuma's revenge. Now, 12% alcohol, in the, that's the limit of natural wine, is diluted with three parts of water to one part wine so that now we have of these four parts, only one part is wine, and that makes a fourth of that original number, so that the alcoholic content is now just 3%. A tumbler of eight ounces of this or less would give you a very small quantity of alcohol, actually about a quarter of an ounce of actual alcohol going into your system. A person would have to linger a long time and drink a lot of this kind of diluted wine to become intoxicated. And so, those of us who are teetotalers like myself would just assume that Jesus never did do this, but facts are facts, and people in that world in that day drank a very diluted kind of wine with water making the wine safe and wine making the water safe. And so Jesus is going to turn the water into wine. There are, sitting nearby, six stone water pots. Now these are good sized water pots. They are each uh, containing two or three measures. And we don't have a word that exactly equates with the, the measure that they use because that measure was eight or nine gallons. And so you have a stone pot that holds not just eight or nine gallon, but two or three of these eight or nine gallon quantities. So let's round it off to 20 or 30 gallons. Six pots holding 20 or 30 gallons of water. Jews would come in and they would uh, dip their hands in the water for cleansing, ceremonial cleansing. And so the water is kind of stale and perhaps a little bit dirty. Jesus says to the servants, now I want you to go out to the well and I want you to draw water and bring it in and fill the water pots up to the brim. Each water pot, 20 or 30 gallon, up to the brim, times six, we're looking at, do the multiplication, we're looking at 120 to 180 gallons that will be turned into wine. That is an incredible quantity of wine. I want you to remember that quantity, huge amount. 
when the wine is drawn out, I should call it water, except it has been turned into wine now, and they draw it and they take it in, and it turns out, as the uh, chief uh, of the feast uh, turns to the groom, and the groom's family were responsible for providing the wine, and they were in the position of being hugely embarrassed and shamed when the wine ran out. So Jesus was sort of saving their neck when he provides the wine. Anyway, the uh, chief uh, of the feast turns to the groom and says, you know, what usually happens is that people put the good wine out first, and then uh, when people have all had some and some have had too much, and if you've been to a wedding like that, there are some people that want to take advantage of the free booze, and why spend a lot of money providing extra booze for the guy that's getting drunk? And so the guy says, usually they put the worst wine out later, but you have saved the best for last. And we learn an, impo an important lesson about the kingdom of God, that both the quantity and the quality of what is provided by Jesus is just outstanding. It puts me in mind of the parable of the sower where the seed that fell into the good ground there in the synoptics grew and the harvested uh, 30, 60, 100 fold, an incredible harvest because that's the way it is in the kingdom of God. The disciples saw this. And this was the first sign, and it was performed there in Cana of Galilee, and they put their faith in him. That is to say, they believed in him. Now, about this time, it is time for the Passover, and that's one of the uh, additional uh, unique characteristics of the Gospel of John. He is the only Gospel that lists the Passovers one by one, and it is by listing these feast occasions that we understand that the ministry of Jesus was three years long. We would not get that information from Matthew, Mark, or Luke. But the first Passover of Jesus' ministry has come, and Jesus goes down to Jerusalem with his disciples. And when they get there, they find a distressing, disappointing situation going on in the temple. Now, you probably understand that the temple had both uh, a temple building with the Holy of Holies at one end and the, where only the high priest could go, and then the holy place where the priest went, and then around that is going to be the courtyard of the men, and you also have the courtyard of the women, and then around the entire compound, you have the courtyard of the Gentiles. Now, when people brought animals to be sacrificed at the temple, the animals had to be examined and they had to be flawless. And it would not be a good idea to drag your goat all the way from Galilee to Jerusalem, only to find out that it wouldn't qualify. So people usually just waited and they bought a pre-inspected animal there. Now where are we going to have these animals uh, set up so that people can buy them for the uh, sacrifice? Do you want a bunch of uh, livestock animals inside the temple building? Of course not. Where the uh, men go to worship? No. Or Jewish women? No. You will set up shop out here in the courtyard of the Gentiles because who cares? if we have turned the courtyard of the Gentiles into a smelly barnyard. Likewise, you had to have the right kind of coins to make a temple offering. And the closest coin to what was a shekel in the Old Testament was a silver coin out of Tyre, not easily available on the street, but available at the temple. And so you have people selling animals, you have money changers setting up shop, and there we are. Okay, Jesus goes in, sees all that mess, remembers that Scripture had intended that God's house will be a house of prayer for all the nations. And he fashions a whip of cords and he begins to drive out the animals. I want you to notice that not, neither here nor at the end of his ministry 
where in the synoptics he cleanses the temple a second time, in neither place does it say that Jesus was angry. But he was purposeful, and he was driving out animals, and he overturned the tables of the money changers, and so animals are going every which way, and coins are rolling all over the place, people scrambling for the coins, trying to recover their animals, and Jesus says, get these out of here, because that's not what you're going to do to his father's house. The leaders challenge him. He explains, you destroy this temple, meaning his body, and I will raise it in three days. They did not understand, and misquoting that will become part of the accusations against him at the end of his life. But that's another story that we'll be getting to later. So Jesus cleanses the temple. He does additional signs, and at the end of chapter two, People put their faith in Him. They believe in Him. We need to move on to chapter 3. And now we run into a man by the name of Nicodemus. He comes by night. Probably because he doesn't want to be seen doing this in the daytime. He is a respectable Jewish leader. He is a Pharisee. There were only 6,000 total Pharisees uh, in the ancient world. He was one of them. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. There were only 70 of these men who are the Supreme Council of Judea, of all the Jews. And Nicodemus comes by night to talk to Jesus. He wants to flatter him, I guess to start with, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God. Jesus, as is characteristic in all of his ministry, usually does not respond immediately to what people say. He doesn't tell them what they ask or what they want to know. He tells them what they need to know. And so in verse 3, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you must be born again. Nicodemus doesn't understand how can a grown man be born all over again. That won't work. And so Jesus says in John 3, 5, You must be born of the water and the Spirit. Water is referring to baptism. Virtually every commentary you could pick up will agree with that point. Sometimes you will hear that uh, water is supposed to be referring to like when a woman's water breaks, but the Greeks had a separate word for that called prophorus, and that is not the word that Jesus used here. Jesus used simply the word for water, not Prophorus, prophorus. That is an R, and I was thinking wrong language. Prophorus. And the whole context of what's been going on points to baptism as well. In chapter 1, John has been baptizing in the wilderness. Jesus is baptized there by John, of course. Uh, in chapter 2, you have the water of uh, purification. But in chapter 3, you will continue to have baptizing. And in chapter 4, Jesus is baptizing and making more disciples and baptizing them than even John. So in the middle of all of this about being born of water, Jesus says also born of spirit. And I do want to stress to you that when Jesus has said you must be born of water, not just water, but also spirit, that when he continues, it is spirit that he wants to stress the most. Nicodemus, a teacher of Israel, should have understood something about regeneration, about the Spirit bringing new life into God's people. Should have understood, should have known, didn't. Jesus chides him for that. But Jesus is getting the people ready for a message of being born again. That's why at the end of his ministry, like in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus sends his disciples to go out into all the world and to preach the Gospel and to baptize everyone in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Regeneration. New life. Everything made new for Nicodemus. Now as we continue, Jesus is still talking to Nicodemus and he says, Marvel not that I say to you, and he changes from the singular you, which shows up in the Greek, to the plural you, because this is a message not just for Nicodemus, it's for everyone. You, plural, must be born 
again. By the time we get to verse 14, Jesus makes a very interesting observation. And he says that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man himself be lifted up. Now, back in the Old Testament, you had uh, a situation where there was a fiery serpent and biting people, people dying, plague sent by God. And Moses speaks to God and God arranges for a solution to the problem. Make a bronze serpent, put it up on a post, and whoever looks upon that will live. Look and live. And Jesus said, I will be lifted up in the same way. And people will have to look upon him. As we go to chapter 8, we'll see lifted up again. And then especially in chapter 12, along about verse 36, Jesus will say, And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. And the next verse says, He said this, indicating by what manner of death he was going to die. So Jesus knows he will have to die. And this leads us to everyone's favorite verse, John 3.16, that God loved the world and He gave His Son that whoever believes in Him would have everlasting life. Now one question does come up in connection with that wonderful passage. If you're looking at your own Bible there, you may have red letters. And if so, where do the red letters end? Because um, we're not really sure. The red letters could end at verse 15, they could end at verse 19, they could end at verse 21. Not too sure. It doesn't particularly matter whether John is explaining or whether Jesus is saying this, because it's true either way, that God sent His Son to save the world, and whoever does not believe in the Son is condemned already. And those are somewhat frightening words. Now, as we go on into this chapter, moving toward the end, we'll find out by verse 22 that Jesus and John are both baptizing. They're both preaching the news of repentance. The kingdom is at hand. They're both preaching a baptism for the remission of sins. But both of them at this point are preaching a preliminary kind of baptism. The baptism of Jesus, baptism of John are the same thing at this point, repentance and forgiveness of sins. It is only later, after the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, that Christian baptism in the name of Jesus becomes something more and different when the gift of the Holy Spirit is added. Because at this point, as John 7 will say, the Holy Spirit is not yet given. So. Jesus and John are both baptizing with this preliminary baptism. And I would remind you that on the day of Pentecost, when Peter is addressing Jerusalem and all these people who have previously gone out to be baptized in the wilderness, he says, now repent and be baptized every one of you. Not just those of you who haven't been baptized already, but every one of you, because now something is new, different, and, and more. One or two final things. Near the end of John chapter 3, John says, when he finds out uh, that his disciples tell him, Jesus, this, this new guy is making and baptizing so many more disciples than you are. Everybody's going off to follow him. And John says, that's okay. He must increase. I must decrease. The attitude of John the Baptist who had been a remarkable figure, uh, for a while the most important man in all of Palestine. His attitude is remarkable as he steps aside to make room for Jesus so that everyone could look at him because John knew his job was to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. He must increase, I must decrease. A good motto for all of us. And then one last thing, at the very end of John 3, uh, it speaks of God giving the Spirit without measure. But it says that in the context of His own Son, Jesus Christ. We should not think that God gives His Spirit without measure, limitlessly, to every one of us. 
The Spirit brought inspiration to the prophets of the Old Testament, but not to all of us. The Spirit brought the work, power to work miracles to the apostles, but not to all of us. The Spirit does dwell in all of us, but only Jesus had the Spirit given without measure. If you read those verses there at the end of uh, chapter 3, you'll see that clearly John is talking about uh, the giving of the Spirit to Jesus Himself. Jesus has full inspiration. Jesus has full power to work miracles, even raise the dead. Jesus has the Spirit completely. And so this kind of wraps up chapters 2 and 3, which were old and new, where the old water of purification is turned into sparkling, wonderful wine, where the old dirty temple is cleansed, as Jesus promises the, the raising up of a whole new temple, himself, his own body. And in chapter 3, even the leader the religious wise man of Israel must be born again as the Spirit comes into his life and regenerates him as he puts faith in Jesus, the one whom God has sent to save the world. I should say this one last thing that I neglected to say in John 3.16, and I don't want to leave it out. John 3.16, God gave the supreme, sublime gift, the greatest gift, when he gave his Son that we could do a simple action to put our faith in Him and follow Him, and then by that have eternal life, the greatest gift that was ever given. The old is giving way to the new in Jesus Christ.